Look up. Consider there are hundreds of Earth observation satellites in low orbit. Every week more are launched. We have sensors collecting data everywhere on Earth every day, both in the sky and on the Earth's surface. This results in a vast amount of data. We hear lots about cryptocurrency, artificial intelligence and quantum computing, and these represent tremendous opportunity. What staggers me, though, is what we're not talking about. Geospatial is changing everything, and almost no one realizes how colossal the opportunity is. I suspect that within three to five years, there'll already be winners and losers. Losers will move too slowly, they'll be overtaken. Others will stumble along, bleeding cash and opportunity. They'll build internal geospatial teams and inadvertently starve them of oxygen. I'm convinced that the winners will build alliances. They'll collaborate to move fast through complex terrain. Geospatial is wickedly complex and it's moving blisteringly fast. Winners will seek the world's top geospatial talent and team up for what might be a bumpy ride. Companies that harness geospatial technology will gain a critical advantage. They'll be working with more and better data. They'll be made aware of the risks and opportunities and they'll see emerging patterns before all their competitors do. Geospatial data isn't just coming from the sky either. When you're routed past construction spotted by another driver, geospatial is getting you to work faster. When your bank looks at transaction histories of others in similar areas, geospatial is getting you the credit that you need. When your insurance company sees that your flood risk is low due to topography, geospatial saves you money and helps the insurance company reduce their risk. These are examples of geospatial analytics providing user value and real business value. Spark Geo is a geospatial consultancy. Through our reputation and involvement in the geospatial community, we managed to attract brilliant people. We group these geospatial experts into teams that are ready to hit the ground running. These teams are gelled, experienced and battle-tested. Industry partners then tap these teams to gain strategic advantage. We offer sector exclusivity, so we're fully committed to each client's needs and goals. In some respects, we are more like a management consultancy than a traditional GIS company. We offer advice and capacity on geospatial research and development, cloud-native software architecture and data science. We have worked with some of the biggest brands in technology. Our teams solve pervasive industry problems. We also release open source code to prove it. We maintain sector exclusive relationships with companies in imagery, big agriculture, and the environment. At this time, we look to expand into insurance, transportation, and banking, and we seek forward thinking leaders in these areas who want to collaborate and are willing to make bold moves. I'm Spark Geo's founder, Will Caddo. I look forward to speaking with you about how your company might use geospatial technology to move forward. Reach me at will at sparkgeo.com. See? see? See what I'm talking about? All right, well, it's good to see that Chris Ho put on the chat board that he was crying along with me. So uh, good to hear it wasn't alone. So um, first off, Will, um, Thanks again for being here, but uh, I guess the question on everybody's mind is what, what was the setting for that video? Where, where, where were you hiking? Uh, 40, no, not even that, 30 minutes away from my house, um, a little place called Teapot Mountain, which is not really a mountain. It's more of a, a it's more of a molehill, <laughs> to be honest. But uh, um, it's, uh, yeah, it's a tiny, it's a, it's a little hill. It's got a beautiful view across the, uh, like towards the Rocky Mountain Trench. I live in the sort of central interior plateau, so there's no big mountains immediately near us, but we are uh, just a few hours from uh, Mount Robson Provincial Park, and that's where the, the, the Rockies properly start. So we have some topography that starts kicking off around us, and then, um, but, but that has a, it's, it's kind of this little geological intrusion sure. that, that gives cool. us the view. So it's, yeah, it's, it's beautiful, nice little hike. Yeah. Lots of lakes nice. and mountains. 
All right. Um, so, uh, you know, when I watched that, I'm like, I, I was trying to get it in your mind and, and you know, what really prompted you um, to pull together a, a video like this? Well, we've wanted to, to tell the story about why, uh, sort of why geospatial is a, an interesting place to be right now. Um, it's, I found the industry has, has suddenly taken, well, I say suddenly, like, within the last five years has suddenly tilted. And I think it's, it's a really interesting time to be in, in our industry. And with that tilt, I think it's an opportunity to start telling a broader story about what location can do. I think that tilt is to do with, um, you know, everyone's got a GPS in their pocket. We've got all these sensors in the sky. We've got a, a bunch of IOT stuff going on. We've got cloud technology, which allows us to you know, draw it all together and in, in air quotes have infinite compute. Uh, all this stuff together, it, it it's, provides enormous opportunity for organizations to, to really understand what geography means um, on a day-to-day -day basis. The geography of kind of human activity, of commerce, of how things move and of where things are and of what people are doing. And I think, I think for a long time, that story was told very effectively internally by, by the defense sector who deeply understood the, the, the power of, of location. Um, you know, it, ever since we've been able to map places out, the, the defense sector has been interested in knowing where other people are and what they are doing for various different purposes. But, but that's a very obvious um, use case for geography. And you know the, the you know the the nature of strategy is is being able to map things out through space and time, and that's really the uh, the, the the toolkit that we're that we're leveraging here. So so I think that's been been well understood, and large governments have understood planning and such. But to see geographic thinking injected more into the commercial sector is a really interesting place for us to uh, to start thinking about where geospatial is going to go as, in air quotes, an industry, but I, I kind of think about it more as a community of practice because I, I like to think about GIS being, or, or geospatial being a horizontal that's kind of hidden inside this vertical, which is GIS. Um, and I think, um, I think there's so many interesting pieces there. And that's why I wanted to start challenging our community to think more broadly about where geospatial sits and the fact that it touches so many different industries uh, and the fact that we can build these data pipelines, they're overtly geospatial, they're, they're, they're touching location, they're manipulating location and they're delivering a product which might not be a map, but is overtly geospatial uh, to numerous different verticals now and therefore numerous different, more verticals uh, are, are uh, you know, a potential for, for our, our experts so i think there's so much fun stuff um and I, we just wanted to raise the awareness a that hey we're in this game uh don't forget about what us where um we can sort of help people out which is obviously the sales message but but more generally that that geospatial is somewhere that people should be thinking about doing business and and will become a market differentiator for sophisticated organizations who want to become more data driven um, there's very few organizations that don't have data that is in some way geographic, you know, even if it's just their, their spreadsheet of sales. I mean, that's going to be a geographic spreadsheet. It's going to be sales that, you know, are, are located in particular places. And if you understand the patterns, then you can, you can leverage that information for, for better outcomes. And that's, that's kind of the message I'm, we're, we're shooting for anyway. Good. Good. Thanks. Thanks for that. So um, tell us a little bit about, why you started or how you started your company. I, I noticed on your, um, when I was doing a little bit of research, um, you, you guys work directly with uh, other tech companies. And, and how, what do you think, the, in your opinion, I guess, what, what difference do you make for them? Uh, yeah, so I, I, um, I kind of largely came out of the resource sector in Canada. I, I did some government science and I did some uh, municipal stuff back in Scotland. Came out to Canada for the big adventure. Haven't gone home yet. Um, ended up in the middle of British Columbia because that's because that's where it, like it's a, it's a big forestry town, a big mill town. Um, 
and, and just haven't left uh, Prince George. Uh, there's, there's absolutely no good business reason for, for me to be sitting where I am right now, <laughs> except for the fact that uh, uh, I get to go ride the trails and you know, go ski and stuff. So, so it's, it's, a, it's definitely a lifestyle choice to be here. But um, I realized after five years in, in forestry that uh, wouldn't it be better to put maps on the internet as opposed to maps on paper? Um, and, and we'd started to be experimenting with the odd, uh, the odd piece of web mapping. Um, and in doing so, that sort of exposed me. And I'd always done, you know, like, I'd always been that guy who had to write that annoying piece of code to do the, the annoying thing. So I, so I had some experience in writing software. Um, so I thought, well, you know what? Maybe, um, maybe I should start a, I, I had to start a company actually, because there was a contract I wanted to do that I found on LinkedIn. And it was in and it was in San Francisco, and uh, so I had to start a Canadian company to contract to a, an American company, and I was a UK citizen at that point, so it was all very complicated. But the long and the short is, uh, I had to start a I had to start a small business to contract to a US entity um, to start putting maps on the internet, and uh, I quite quickly got a chance to visit San Francisco and realized, wow, there's a there's a lot of stuff happening in in this town, and we should. Well, you know, I, at that point, it was just me. I should be thinking about doing more in the technology sector because boy, people like, you know, geospatial is just hitting this place. And really the algorithmic questions they're asking are just the same things that we were doing in the forestry sector, except in software, as opposed to in, in some kind of, you know, GUI. So if you can, if you're comfortable with software and you know the algorithms, you're off to the races. Um, and that's, that's really the, the inception of of Squirt Geo, and we're not really doing anything wildly different now, other you know than, than we were. We're we're talking to technology companies. We're helping them with uh, expertise, particular expertise around geospatial. We've we've held on to our niche, uh, and I think that's a really powerful thing. And I'd recommend any small business to do the same thing. Um, held on to our niche, and then just you know keep talking about what we do. Keep talking about the power of geospatial. Keep talking about um, how we can add capacity where necessary or um, how we can sort of run full projects if necessary as well. And just stay excited about, about maps, stay excited about location and, and, and be excited about new applications of it. And I think that, that, that curiosity has been, been really useful for us as an organization as well. Good. And uh, hey, you touched on it a little bit um, earlier about uh, working uh, with different with other sectors, so I'm curious, which, which, in your opinion, what sectors do you feel um, have the biggest growth potential or competitive uh, advantage uh, advantage by harnessing geospatial uh, technology and information? I think one of the most obvious ones is probably the insurance sector. Um, I think there's a lot of information that the insurance sector could. Uh, leverage more effectively. Uh, I think it's a data literate sector, but perhaps not necess perhaps haven't necessarily leveraged technology, which is kind of an interesting uh, dichotomy that they would be data literate, but yes, yeah, sort of technology laggards to some extent. Uh, that's why we see so many insure tech startups, I think. Um, so I think there's a lot of opportunity in that sector. Um, I think what I would like to see more geospatial and banking. I think banks are a wealth of information, a gold mine of information about people, but also about places. Um, for like, so mapping people, like getting one points of interest data set together is annoying, but possible. But keeping that data set up to date is an absolute nightmare. Um, keeping it, so keeping it rolling, so you, you can build the best POI data set on earth today, but tomorrow is going to be out of date. But banks have this automatic updating system called transactions, which conceivably will update that database instantly for you because someone has, you know, they run their MasterCard through a machine and suddenly it, it's not a McDonald's, it's not a Burger King. Oh, that's really interesting. POI's changed. And I think that kind of, that kind of thinking is really powerful. Um, and so I think there's going to be a lot of interesting um, and silly 
opportunities from large, potentially old school enterprise organizations who just discover that they have a gold mine of data that, that they could leverage themselves internally, or they could sell, or they could find a partner, or they could do any number of different things. But it would be enormously valuable to society to start getting that data moving. Um, and, and of course, there's significant privacy concerns, and it needs to be anonymized, and it needs to be, there's some of those data sets need to be aggregated <coughs> properly and all the rest of it, and, and, and it should be done, and it should be done well. But once that is done, once we understand those things, and once we sort of uh, figure out those various hurdles, the opportunity for, uh, for selling a live points of interest data set is enormous. Um, mm -hmm. and, and understanding, I don't know, the value of a Canadian to Las Vegas. I think that's a really interesting data set. I think that'd be great. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> I think, but you know what, you start thinking about that, you start, yeah, I see this really interesting, overtly geographic, knowledge that can be mined that that, that, that that we can put to really good use um so i think there's i think there's some things around those subjects which are really worth investigating um so i i think banking is really cool i think insurance is cool um i think retail can do a lot more geospatial um i think uh, you know the 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 older users of geospatial are not going to go away so i don't think gis is going to to go away uh, by any means, because you know what, people are still going to have to draw boxes around trees at some point. You know, so that whole resource sector thing is going to have to keep on going. Uh, the, the the defense sector thing is going to have to keep on going. We need all that stuff. I just think there's going to be more, which is yeah. which is really interesting for our um, our community to absorb and to leverage. Frankly, mm -hmm. we're going to start pumping out some more talent. I guess that's it. That's it. I hear it's yeah. coming from your neck of the woods. We've got lots of well, programming. We're trying. Yeah. <laughs> we are trying. Um, hey, so, um, you know, we talked about the sectors and, and your company a little bit. So do you see, is there any major uh, technological breakthrough um, that you think is on the horizon that's going to be a game changer for this industry? That's on the horizon? Um, yeah. And so I... I would say that the, the, the inflection point for geospatial came when we started leveraging the cloud. And I think what's happened, so I think that's really important. Uh, and I would argue that uh, organizations that effectively leverage the cloud are in a, in a very enviable position at this point. I think that's a really important step forward. I think the next step is in, you know, it, it sounds super, needlessly technical but uh i think what's happening around ard in remote sensing is is really important and it's it's really geeky and technical but the problem is that one remote sensing sensor doesn't really can't really be referenced with another sensor so if you get a picture from landsat it's kind of looks similar to a picture from uh worldview but it's really quite a different thing um and in the end, because we have a bazillion sensors in the sky, not you can't rely on the human eye to do that cross comparison. Like we're really good at, at, at doing some level of um, context-based comparison. We can do that in our in our brains. But problem is when you want to um, answer a global scale question using remote sensing, you can't really do it with humans unless you have altogether too many of them to build a business around so mm -hmm. instead you need to use machines so if you need to use machines and you need to have data sets which are referenceable to each other and that's where analysis ready data the analysis ready data movement if you like has has sort of come to the fore so being able to be able to have confidence that 400 nanometers on one uh, on one optical sensor is 400 nanometers on another optical sensor or something of that nature really makes a, a lot of sense uh, across the board and it sounds boring and it's like saying it's like the vector equivalent is saying we need to do better metadata but it, it's true um, we need to do better metadata this is very boring uh, but uh, in the end if we if we do better metadata then we get uh, we get machines to do uh, a boatload of work on our behalf which means that we get to ask much bigger questions of our landscapes and our our sort of our you know 
our human movement, if you like, our human activities across the earth. And, and at that point, we start getting to a really interesting place in geospatial. Good, thanks. Hey, uh, I was trying to bait you into talking about 5G and, and you know, <laughs> internet cities, but you know, yeah. they can ask. Well, it you know what, like, it's, but, but 5G is the same thing. You know, it allows us to do more. Uh, it allows us to, uh, and, and it's funny because you look at all the adverts for 5G for, for Sprint or, or, or whomever, AT&T, the, all their use cases are location-based. It's like automated yeah. vehicles or delivery this or uh, real-time that. It's like, oh, it's all location. All they're talking yeah. about is pushing coordinates and, and large amounts of, of augmented reality-based data around. Otherwise, it's like, how, how many videos can I stream to my phone at once, you know, on, on my commute? That's the other massive use case. It's like, like watching Netflix on your commuter train. Um, so if, it, if we're thinking about location being a sort of robust differentiator, then, then moving data fast to, for, for the purposes of leveraging location is, is another pivotal use case for sure. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm gonna switch it up a little bit here, and I want I want I want you to step into our shoes here, since you're one of the premier uh, thought leaders in, in the industry. So, um, as you as we talked before, and you've talked with uh, Andy, um, you know, here in St. Louis, we're really focused on trying to build uh, this region as a geospatial center of excellence um, for the nation. So. Um, if you were in our shoes, what, what would you focus on first? Uh, I think education is probably pivotal to the affair. Uh, but I also think that cross-pollinating education with uh, entrepreneurship opportunities is really cool. So I think um, building kind of a startup innovation um, environment, I think is, is really neat. And I haven't really seen one that's been kind of location focused to date. So I think there's a lot of opportunity around um, building startups that are geospatially focused. I see more interest from the VC community around having a geospatial portion of a portfolio, which means uh, there are organized, there are funders actively looking to invest in robust startup ideas uh, that need some kind of growth opportunity. So I think that's cool. Uh, I see more interest in organizations like NGA willing to try things out, um, which means that, you know, what you got Incutel and such. But if you've got that linkage directly into NGA in your, in your city, then I think that's a really powerful linkage to have already there and you know there's other sort of big big kind of geo players um like uh i'd say bear crop science guys they're doing a ton so nga is doing a ton there's just a lot of geo happening uh so focusing on education so you have the the, the young folks up and coming uh cross pollinating that with some uh business school stuff i think that'd be really powerful uh seeing if you can sort of build some kind of program around that um and then uh, I think is going to be a big talent attraction thing. I'm, I'm, I have this kind of paradox in that I, uh, I, I run a company that does a lot of location stuff yet. We're also a remote first company. So we're kind of, we care about location, but, but, uh, we also feel that location join the meeting what you're doing business is not necessarily a key differentiator. And, and for us, that's interesting because we get to hire anyone from anywhere in Canada, uh, as opposed to just hiring people in my city. So when you're thinking about bringing people to a particular location, you also, I think, need to think about lifestyle values. So why do they want to be in a particular place? Um, I think the future is possibly not that people need to be in a place for a particular job. I think we're all having that, um, that experience right now uh it's being underlined a number of times that you do not have to be in an office uh to succeed certainly in the knowledge sector um so then therefore the, the question becomes okay we're going to link um st louis to this industry um this particular industry 
then what are the attributes of St. Louis that are, go are going to attract people for lifestyle purposes as well as for uh, sort of um, uh, industrial expertise purposes? So I think that's an interesting question to, to ruminate mm -hmm. on for a while. Well, we, uh, we shouldn't have trouble attracting um, people. We are the um, Stanley Cup champions. I don't know if I'm <laughs> yeah. that. Right. Yeah, I thought you'd bring that up. <laughs> yeah. so, so, so there we are. Um, all right, so, so we never let our guests um, off the hook until we find out um, a little bit more uh, about you personally. So uh, assuming you don't do uh, geospatial 24-7, um, what, what, what do you do in, in your free time up there? Well, I, uh, I have three daughters, so we're, we're, we're a busy family. Uh, we spend a lot of time skiing uh, when there's snow, and we do spend a lot of time hiking and running when there's not. So uh, outdoorsy-ish stuff, climbing mountains, running around. My daughters, uh, this is funny, this, was, this, would, this would never have happened in the UK. My daughters are, are keen biathletes, so they, they ski and they shoot. Um, before before coming here, uh, I just associated that with uh, the baddie in one of the James Bond movies, um, who I think ended up getting you know carved up in the groomer. Nevertheless, um, that's what they do for fun. Uh, so we're uh, so they're uh, sort of roller skiing outside on the on the streets. Uh, they have these skis with with wheels on them, and they they pull around on that, and uh, and then running up and down the trails. Um, mm -hmm. So that's that's our that's our fun. <laughs> well, so so I, I probably should ask how old are your daughters that are uh, skiing and shooting? Uh, oldest is um, oldest is thirteen. Youngest is nine. Um, so yeah, yeah, hmm. they're familiar with uh, yeah. So coming from the UK, I didn't uh, yeah I, I didn't really think I'd have four rifles in my house, but I do. So here we are. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well. Uh, yeah, uh, I'll be praying for you with the hat trick of daughters. So uh, yeah, well, you know what? Yeah, I guess maybe it's a good thing to have four rifles in the, in yeah, the basement. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so this is uh, this is the portion um, where we uh, turn it over to um, the the audience to to ask a few questions. So, um, BJ, are you going to um, moderate those questions? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think uh, our group is uh, intimate enough that uh, that we can uh, okay, we take can... turns here. If you have a question, you can drop it in the chat or uh, unmute yourself here. Let me uh, turn permissions on there to for everyone to unmute themselves. I guess I'll uh, I'll start with the first question here. Uh, and uh, Will and I were kind of talking about this uh, going into it. Um, if we're if we're saying geospatial can change everything, uh, there's of course of course as we're aware here, quite a bit of civil unrest in uh, in our city in our country right now um, regarding racial equity. Uh, it granted technology can't fix everything, but in what ways do you see uh, geospatial technology possibly being applied to to address such a such a big issue yeah i i think it's it's I, well you know first off i come at this you know from a deeply privileged place um i have you know all all the benefits that society could offer someone um so but with that in mind i would say that it's beholden upon organizations like ours uh and people like myself and others of the same ilk to be thinking deeply about what we do and why we do it. And I think there is a danger, um, certainly in the technology space, that we move too fast for policy and we move too fast to do cool things without really deeply thinking about why we do them and if they're the right thing to do. Um, so I, I think I think technology and technologists need to have a deeper level of uh, empathy and just need to be willing to strike up appropriate conversations to properly understand the outcome of, of uh, a thing that they do. I, I, with that in mind, I would say that geospatial is a tool um, and that tool can be put to good use and it can be put to poor use. And I think we need to be very cognizant that 
um, we need to be aware of um, unforeseen circumstances of, of putting uh, the geospatial tool to any use. However, I think geospatial can also uncover important trends. Uh, data tells a story and that story is one that sometimes doesn't get told without data telling it. So um, I think to your, to your point earlier, BJ, the, uh, the, the fact that COVID is, is hitting um, certain communities harder than others, certain demographics harder than others, is a story that might not have been told without adequate data. And that's maybe a good use of geospatial technology to understand that there is a deeply sort of demographic split in uh, how people are actively catching, uh, a, you know, what is in all intents and purposes a deadly disease. Um, so if a pandemic is hitting certain communities harder than others, it's beholden upon us to to know that, to tell that story, and to make sure those people who are in a position to build policy around those things can can make sensible decisions based off that data. And then, oh, but with that in mind, understanding that data can be deeply opinionated based on who is capturing that data, why they're capturing it, what their general habits are, what their uh, what their demographic stroke racial blind spots might be. So I think being deeply aware and being reflective on, on what we typically do on a day-to-day -day basis is absolutely critical. Um, and also I think as, as technologists, we need to um, embrace a greater level of diversity. Uh, and, and I don't think we've done that, done a very good job of that to date. I think we can do a better job of that. Um, so I think there's, there's a lot of things that we as technologists and we as geographers can do uh, to, to do um, a better job of, uh, of, of le leveling the playing field as much as we can. D d does that help in any way? Is that a reasonable yeah, answer to yeah, that Yeah, absolutely. And, and thank you for your, for your thoughtful response on that. Um, I do have a, Patty sent a, a question in chat here. Uh, she says, we have been thinking a lot about augmented reality uh, or augmented and virtual reality solutions to issues such, a re such as remote learning and remote work, uh, especially during this pandemic period. Uh, can you comment on the role of AR, VR, or XR, uh, and how it might impact geospatial tradecraft or what opportunities you might see moving forward in such areas? I think, uh, I think AR is super interesting. Um, I think, I think we're going to see a ton of investment in AR and that AR is going to be deeply geospatial. And I think that's going to be a really interesting place. I was, uh, for my sins, uh, disappointed that the Google glass didn't really take off <laughs> as, as ridiculous as the idea was. Uh, I thought that was going to be a really neat play for, for geospatial and for augmented reality and just being able to look over a place and see information presented of about that place um, as like what was effectively a second screen for your life um, on, on a, on, you know, obviously this enormous privacy issues as addressed by uh, Black Mirror um, in great detail and pleasant and pleasantly great detail. But getting over those and if we can build policy around those and understand them better the idea of augmented reality i think is going to be super powerful and i think that's i think the, the nature of augmented reality is that it needs to be geographic um virtual reality is a different kettle of fish eh, in, in that you're sort of you're typically experiencing a, an entirely separate uh world um in which case it's geospatial but perhaps not uh not um not our planet that we're on just a, a, a fictional planet. But one would expect that uh, um, coordinate systems still exist on fictional planets. So I think there's, I think there's an interesting, interesting play there too. Um, but I, I really think AR is a, a neat place to look. I think we'll see more from the, from the like Silicon Valley tech sector on AR. And I think we'll see that being very geocentric. And I think they'll be looking at 
different ways of locating themselves based on um, imagery and on the location of buildings and, and that kind of stuff that might not be overtly G GPS based. I think we'll see more innovation around location. I think GPS has been a tremendous tool. I'm a great fan of GPS, but I think we'll see other, um, other sources of location focused data come to bear. Uh, we've got a question from Andy uh, in the crowd here saying, uh, if you were to build a new company in the geospatial space, what would you build? Uh, sectors like insurance or banking, uh, what solutions need to exist to help them advance or to advance these types of industries from a geospatial perspective? Uh, let me think. I think that's, that's, a, that's actually a great question. I'm not sure what I would do right now. I really like insurance. I think insure tech's cool. Uh, I think, I think, uh, and I say that because I think there's a lot of people losing their shirts right now on catastrophic insurance claims. And that, uh, that tells me that something in the system is broken. And if that something in the system is broken, then uh, it's a really good place for an insure tech startup to, to do business. Uh, I think that's really interesting. Um, what that solution is, I'm not sure. We're doing some work around impervious surfaces and flooding, uh, but I think there's other pieces to that puzzle which are deeply interesting too. We have this um, kind of ridiculous idea. Uh, we have a, we put together a brand called Prescient.Earth, um, and and the the core of that idea is. Um, that as geospatial people, we spend a lot of time, um, you know, retrospectively analyzing things that did happen. Um, and we're really good at figuring out what did happen. Um, and, uh, but given the fact that we have so much what you could call training data, you know, what Landsat's been in the sky for what, 30 or 40 years now? That's a lot of training data. I mean, we don't necessarily see it as such. And as discussed earlier, ARD is a bit of a problem. But we have a lot of information about the earth that has been captured over a long period of time. So why can we not leverage that and start looking forward instead of backwards? And I think that's a really interesting place to, to be thinking. Um, so let's think about likelihoods instead of, um, instead of accuracy assessments. Let's start thinking about um, patterns that happened in one location and therefore the likelihoods of, of something else happening in a different location. I think that's kind of a powerful place to be, to be putting down some, some intellectual capital. I think that would be a good, be, also it's kind of looking to the future is kind of a cool thing. So you might get some VC funding for that, just for coolness alone. <laughs> coolness factor. Hey BJ, yeah, hey, let's, take, uh, <laughs> let's take Pete off the dolls. Uh, question and then um, we'll, we'll go ahead and wrap it up. Okay, great. Yeah, we have a uh, Pete from Lidos, uh, our friend from Lidos here, asking. Uh, you mentioned the importance of geospatial education at the uh, higher level. At higher levels, uh, do you believe it is important to reintroduce geography at grade school levels, uh, elementary school levels, to provide that uh, local to provide that local to in international spatial context that geospatial intelligence rides on. Um, uh, uh, 100%, 100%. I think, I think geography is kind of a, uh, I think it's a lost art. I think understanding other countries, understanding uh, the relationships between other countries, cultural differences. I think those things are, are very powerful for building, for understanding different relationships across across humanity, but also just, just the, the pure geographic interest of, of different landforms, I think is, is interesting. Like I'm a mountain guy, so I like looking at mountains, but I'm also interested in just general landscapes and land, land features. Um, understanding maps, I think is, is kind of a key lifestyle skill. In the same way that people aren't taught really to fill in a tax return, they're not really taught to read a map anymore. And I, I think these are things that actually, are from a day-to-day -day basis are really pivotal. Even if you're like a business sales guy, 
you're, you're following a map from meeting to meeting, whether you like it or not, and that's a life skill. So if you're not taught that at elementary level, then that, that becomes kind of an onerous thing to have to learn. So I think, I think geography and, and sort of spatial intelligence, spatial awareness, I think all these things are, are really pivotal. And I, I, I do think they should be, be taught at, at, a, at an early age. I, I, think, uh, I think just geography is, is key understanding where things are and where people are you don't have to know all the capital cities but a few of them would be nice yeah that, uh, I, I, I lied uh, bj um uh, uh bobby lankowski um, asked a question and, and she's the matriarch of geospatial intelligence uh in this city i'm not gonna have her question not be answered so um will did uh, you did mention the a plethora of Landsat Earth operations. Part of the reason for ARD architecture was in fact to help with predictive analysis. Have you seen commercial opportunities? Uh, commercial opportunities for ARD? Oh yeah, innumerable. Uh, the fact that you could switch one sensor out for another is really interesting. The fact that you could uh, meaningfully combine new sensors as they come online, I think is really interesting. Uh, being able to uh, have um, a broader view, like you think you've got this kind of broad eye view, and then you can zoom in on something. So you've got your your uh, your low resolution um, kind of tipping and queuing mechanism to allow you to to uh, like tip and queue a higher resolution or a multi spectral or some other kind of sensor. I think that's really powerful. Um, pure commercial operations. Um, I think I think just being able to I mean, like if we think about SAR, there's a, a, the, the the fact that Ursa um, decided not to launch um, their own constellation of star satellites because there are so many star satellites out there tells you that there is a need in the community to be able to do some level of meaningful sensor fusion. I don't think um, I I think the future of of upstream geospatial is um, a variety of what I would call downstream geospatial partners, people who really know a particular market vertical and know a lot about counting cars for retail or know a lot about uh, impervious surfaces, talked about already. Um, so those companies who know a lot about one thing and can source data on, like from the, from the upstream company, source data and sell it for them, I think that's super powerful because then the remote sensing company doesn't need to know everything about the entire horizontal that is geospatial, they just need to know how to manage a partner relationship and drive that thing in. The neat, the, the neat thing about the upstream downstream um, relationship is that um, if you think about the defense sector, you're selling imagery into an organization that's very sophisticated around using imagery. Like you can use an image and have a look on the ground and see what you want to see. It, it, it's pretty straightforward. That use case is, is well understood. But if you're, um, if you're an upstream company, if you're a satellite remote sensing company, and you want to, to sell um, a car counting analytic, well, if you do that, A, you've got to build the analytic, and B, you've got to start finding the people who want to buy that analytic. Or if, if on the other hand, you just sell to this retail uh, analysis company they get to be they get to do the car counting analytic they get to build it into their model and they can talk to all those other retail people on your behalf and all you've got to do is just manage that pipeline so it it, it totally changes the game and ard is one of the is one of the movements that allows that kind of relationship to flow because because you you can allow sensor fusion to happen, which means that a particular car counting company isn't necessarily linked just to one, um, just to one provider. They could pull in different kinds of so sources of data to allow them to grow in a more meaningful way. So I, I think I think ARD is an enabler, and I think it will be across this this entire kind of upstream downstream geospatial um, uh, kind of ecology, I guess, as well as environment. All right. Hey, th thanks, Will. And uh, thanks for everything. Thanks for participating in this. I know I hit you on short notice, but 
um, you were always on the queue for one of the must have guests. Um, uh, well, thanks this. very much, Mark. It's, it's, it, it's been a pleasure and uh, good luck with Geosaurus and good luck with uh, the rest of uh, the growth of geospatial in St. Louis. Yeah. Any, any more uh, videos on the horizon? I know we might do one in the fall, like do a, okay. do a, um, a redux or a turn two or something. All right, look forward to it. Um, all right, hey, uh, I got a couple um, uh, public service announcements. So uh, Geo Futures, um, uh, Andy's online, the, the strategic roadmap for advancing uh, geospatial and location technology cluster in St. Louis. Um, that reveal is going to take place uh, Tuesday, June 23rd, uh, 11 uh, a.m. Central. Uh, check our newsletter. We have the, the link to, to register to that. Um, looking forward to that. Um, uh, I know a lot of you have been um, already uh, tuning into the USGIF GeoConnect um, series. Uh, next, uh, today was NGA's 2020 technology strategy and next week will be uh, uh, GeoInt from my basement. Um, so who, who knows what that'll be about. But Tish Long, uh, former NGA director, uh, will be the moderator of that. And then one plug for Jake Latkes, the National Security Innovation uh, Network uh, programs. Uh, uh, they're looking, uh, they're hosting uh, the Defense Urban Online Challenge at the $15,000 competi uh, competition uh, to develop novel solutions for sensing. So that closes on the 28th of June. Um, and so uh, please check that out if you're, if you're interested. Will, we owe you um, several beers when you get back to St. Louis. And uh, we're looking forward to everybody traveling again so that we can do these in person. Thanks very much, guys. All right. Thanks, everyone.